much. No, cheers. I appreciate it. Good evening. Are there any uh, English people here this evening? <laughs> Thank you. What a lovely response. So I'm never sure when I ask that question of English people what manner of response I'll receive. Sometimes an Englishman will just demurely lift a handkerchief. <laughs> yes, I'm English. What of it? <laughs> then, of course, we English have a large hooligan fraternity. There's always a risk that's like, yeah, I'm English, and hurl a chair onto the stage <laughs> as a form of greeting. I would urge a more uh, good-mannered approach, if that's OK, because uh, I sort of, personally, I feel that if we can't offer the Americans good manners, there's very little else we can offer them. <laughs> if you're going to behave shabbily, fellow countrymen, we will probably never retrieve this colony. <laughs> Buck your ideas up! They'll realise they can't cope! <laughs> Soon enough. Yeah, uh, English people will... <laughs> that was... That's just an accident. <laughs> Sometimes I forget there's people looking. So, oh. No, thank you, dear. No, I'm trying my hardest. <laughs> um, English people present will be able to testify that... Uh, um, I'm famous in England. <laughs> Admittedly... Fame does lose a little of its cachet when you have to tell people that you have it. <laughs> and English people always say to me, Oh, I bet you love it in America, not being famous. It must be a relief. Do you love it? I fucking hate it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have taken, uh, as a result of my lack of fame in your country, I've taken to carrying a laptop around with me so that I can contextualise myself better using internet clips to show people. You know, makes me feel better about myself. YouTube, I have prostituted so brutally that I now, I now call it simply MeTube. <laughs> there ain't no apologies for that because, like, my personality doesn't work without fame. Without fame, this haircut just looks like mental illness. <laughs> I only use Google as well for self-validation to check that I still exist. I've only ever Googled my own name. As soon as I put in R, it's sort of like bored of me. It goes, Russell Brand. <laughs> it comes up straight away, Russell Brand. I don't like Google's attitude in general, actually. It's a little bit smug, isn't it? Like if you make one little spelling mistake. Didn't you mean? <laughs> in like sarcastic italics. <laughs> oh dear, oh you poor lamb. Didn't you mean psychosomatic, not psychosomatic? <laughs> One day, if Google doesn't watch its step, I shall Google Google. <laughs> then stand back as it devours itself like a cyber serpent eating its own tail. Consume your own flesh like jealousy, Google. <laughs> I've already done that. It don't really care. It just, the things what's along the top, like news, maps, images, it just lists that down the side. <laughs> but somewhere it knows I'm wasting its time. <laughs> it's a minor victory. I suppose the validation sought through fame is a further attempt to somehow bolster and address the inner void that I sort of feel lurking within me that I suppose ultimately ought be fulfilled by enlightenment. This Swami once goes to me, all forms of devotion and worship are the inappropriate substitutes for the devotion we all feel for God. Right? So I'm all right, I'll try and be nice then, I get it. 
Right, so I try and be nice and good to people, but even that is a complex idea because of the idea of reciprocal altruism. We're only altruistic or nice, apparently, because we want something back. And that kind of makes sense to me, right? Because, like, right, check this out. Right on the way here tonight, I, uh, I see a homeless person, right, by an ATM, actually, which is as good a place as any to stand if you are homeless, because <laughs> more difficult to deny that you've got money <laughs> in that situation. Oh, what is this? Oh no, this is just a, a picture of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> so like, you know, you were there and I felt, you know, oh, give him a couple of dollars here, yeah, mate. A couple of dollars. But if I'm honest, I was kind of, I was doing it for the wrong reasons a bit. I, was doing it, I did it because I felt a bit nervous about this show. And I thought if I gave him some money that the show might go well. You know, like... I kind of use homeless people like scabby wishing wells. <laughs> like smelly vending machines for good karma. Pop in a couple of dollars, I shall have good luck for the rest of the day. <laughs> in seeking further fame, right, I allowed myself to uh, be seduced into hosting the MTV VMA Awards. <laughs> Well, thanks, but I wish you'd been there on the night. <laughs> I could have done with you. It was quiet in there. The thing about doing them MTV VMA Awards is that uh, I wasn't famous. So it's sort of like difficult to be in that position of authority without the, the fame that one would typically associate with that position, right? And I felt dead nervous about it. So, like, I'm, I asked, I'm friends with uh, Noel Gallagher out of the band Oasis, right? <laughs> I'll pass that on to him. <laughs> so because I was a bit nervous about doing them VMAs, I goes, oh, would it be all right, Noel, if I came on to uh, your song Rock and Roll Star, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, come on to that. Then the audience will be looking at a bloke they've never seen before while listening to a track they've never heard of. <laughs> Intelligently, MTV tried to ally me to existing American celebrities to make me seem more authenticated. So I did like some promotional work with American stars like LL Cool J, who's a lovely, lovely fella, right? Although we ultimately speak the same language, me and LL Cool J, it's difficult because we approach it from very different perspectives. And when we met, there was a kind of jarring linguistic paradox. Yeah. Yo, yo, Russ, cuz, what's up, my homie? Let's blaze a blunt for the nation. Oh, yes, no, that sounds lovely. Have a cup of tea, thank you. That's jolly good. I love all of your homos. You're delightful. <laughs> Pertinently, part of the promotional campaign involved the uber-famous Britney Spears. Yes, difficult, though. That's what I thought. It's difficult to meet someone when you've already seen their vagina. <laughs> you go? Hello. Oh, and you. <laughs> and I'm lovely to her because she's a lovely, lovely woman, dead sweet, but the promotional campaign was flawed in that they decided to promote me as all edgy. All oh, edgy. But I don't want to say anything offensive to her because I don't know her, her feelings, but how can I be all edgy and not mention all the things that happened to her that year, but I can't mention, I can't go, because what you want to say, if you're in a room with Britney Spears, you want to go, what'd you shave your head for, love? <laughs> what'd you shave your head for? Why, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Is it a statement? What's going on? Tell us. But you don't say nothing like that, because it might upset her, and she's all lovely, and a human being, and a person, so I was explaining to the MTV promotional executives that it would be a bit difficult for me. I said, you know, come on, it's going to be a bit difficult, like not being able to mention all those things that have happened to Britney. Don't you think there's going to be a little bit of an elephant in the room? Right? And an MTV executive, to his eternal credit, said, what if there was literally an elephant in the room? <laughs> Like, what, a real elephant? Well, yeah, sure. What? You know where to get an elephant? I can locate an elephant. <laughs> so, I'm gonna meet an elephant. <laughs> Absolutely. It was at that point that I stopped thinking like an adult. <laughs> There's gonna be an elephant!
heaven here. Can I touch it? Can I kiss him? Can I touch him on the trunk? Do they really never forget? Yeah, that elephant, they got an actual elephant and it's exciting because like, right, Britney Spears, she's there, but there's an elephant there and I've met loads of pop stars in my life. I ain't ever met an elephant before. And I sort of looked into its timeless eyes like corridors into prehistory, somehow unjudgmental but knowing all, an innocence, a poignance, a beauty, somehow all could be resolved and absolved within them eyes. But it was a girl elephant, right? And at one bit it sort of went like as they do in cartoons, like that, and I saw its vagina, <laughs> big elephant vagina, just there. There's like Britney over there, and I thought, can anybody in this room be discreet about their vaginas. <laughs> Come the night itself, right? Honest to God, my idea while hosting them MTV Awards was, ah, right, I'll just have a bit of a laugh and not cause any bother. It'll be like a light-hearted romp. What ensued was a bloodbath. <laughs> Me and Matt, me mate, who I write with when I do stuff like telly, we had this little booth backstage, we was in there writing just on our own, like we had the script all straight, nice, oh, that's good, all well prepared. Then the opening link was this, right? Now, on Fox News, they had a poll to have me thrown out of the country. That's hurtful. <laughs> but also flattering. <laughs> the kind of guilt that follows ejaculation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ah, oh. link was this. <clears throat> As a ambassador for the rest of the world, I would like to urge you, the people of America, to vote Barack Obama for your president. Right? Again, wish you could have been there. <laughs> I continued. A lot of people, racists I think they're called, say America is not ready for a black president. But I know America to be a liberal, forward-thinking country. After all, you've had that retarded cowboy fella in the White House for eight years. <laughs> we were all very impressed with that in Europe. It's nice to let him have a turn, we thought. In my country, you wouldn't be trusted with a pair of scissors. <laughs> So, right, I said that perfectly inoffensive bit of a laugh joke and looked out into the sea of blank faces of billionaire record executives. <laughs> and then I had to go backstage and go, yeah, Matt, this, this ain't working at all well. <laughs> they don't like it. <laughs> right? And then we realised at that point that what previously we had presumed to be a script was actually a litany of cruel and incendiary insults. <laughs> There's no way, though, I could have said the things that we'd written in that script. If too offensive, too rude, would have caused me too much trouble. I couldn't say it then, but I can say it now. <laughs> the MA links. Right? Kanye West was performing at the awards, even though previously he said he would never do that. This was the link to introduce him for his performance at this year's MTV VMA Awards. <clears throat> I've just heard that George Bush is making his way down to Louisiana to meet victims of Hurricane Gustav. He's doing this mainly so he doesn't piss Kanye West off again. <laughs> MTV pissed Kanye off at these awards last year, and Kanye refused to ever work with MTV again, ever under any circumstances. Wow, that's admirable. What resolution and incredible resolve. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kanye West. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to be able to say that. <laughs> so it's got to go. Then there was a bit, I said, right, I oh, said some things about uh, the Jonas Brothers, right? <laughs> it's only mucking about. I've not come all the way from England with the express intention of, can we bring down the Jonas Brothers? 
I ain't got strong views on the Jonas Brothers. Just like, for me, they're like uh, cotton candy or butter. It's just a thing in the world. Have them. Have as many as you want. <laughs> I don't mind. It doesn't matter. I'm just mucking around, right? But I said some stuff about their promise rings and Jordyn Sparks, whose name I can never feel comfortable saying, Jordyn Sparks, she won a talent contest. She came out, right? <laughs> She come out and goes, uh, yeah, um, I'd just like to say that uh, you shouldn't mock promise rings because not everybody wants to be a slut. <laughs> Thereby condemning everyone who has sex ever <laughs> is sort of prostitutes. <laughs> oh, please, can we have sex? We really love each other. Save it for Jesus. <laughs> But it was good in a way because it meant that a little bit of our script suddenly became useful because it seemed like a riposte to Jordan's remarks. And here is that bit of the script, right? <clears throat> hey, I'm only joking about the Jonas Brothers. Sorry, I don't want to piss off any teenage fans. Quite the opposite. By opposite, I don't mean I want to piss on any teenage fans. I know you've had a bit of trouble with that a couple of years ago. I believe I'll fly R. Kelly, right? <laughs> I can see how it happens though. Kid comes up to you, I want an autograph. You remember what fun it is to write your name in the snow? <laughs> Suddenly there's a court case. <laughs> Cut from the final show. <laughs> Britney Spears won three awards that night. Good for her, like, lovely girl, as I say. And like, but. What was weird, right? She was on that stage three times, and each time she gave like the same speech. I want to thank my family, I want to thank the record company, I want to thank God. Interesting to me, the relentless gratitude to God, because I myself believe in God, right? But I kind of think it's a complex idea, God, you know? And that if there is an omnipotent, omniscient being controlling all from the infinitesimally small to the inconceivably large, I don't reckon he cares what happens at the MTV VMA Awards. <laughs> oh, what's that? The VMA Awards is all that's lovely. Oh, Lil Wayne's won something. No, no, no. Thank you, Lil Wayne. more famous, didn't fulfil the gaping void within the old soul, of course not, but did make me a little more notorious in this country. In fact, during the uh, week of the MTV VMA Awards, I, me, Russell, was the fifth most Googled thing in the world, right? Check this out. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is like, like so because you're such a generous, lovely audience, it's like performing to a room full of my mother, really. <laughs> a well done. Yeah, no. Most cool called a fifth month, that's very good. <laughs> a very reputable search engine. <laughs> Check it out, right? So the week of the VMA's fifth most Googled thing in the world, Russell Brand. That's me. Check this out. Seventh most Googled thing in the world, VMA host. That's me, right? Check this out before. Hold on to your hats now, kids, right? 37th most Googled thing in the world, Russell Brown. I'm going to have that as well. Of course... <laughs> Not all the people who discovered me the week of the VMAs were utterly enamoured. Not if the death threats or anything are go by. <laughs> I do think, though, with thanks for the sympathy in that, because sympathy can usually be converted into fellatio very quickly. <laughs> so, like, it's really an anonymous death threat. To say I've got a death threat of someone I know, right? Say someone I know went, Hey, you, Russell, you're very... Vain uh, and self-involved. I'm going to kill you. I go, ah, oh, oh, don't, mate. Please don't kill me. I can change. But like, an anonymous death threat. Why? How do you get that riled? By something on the telly. But how do you? Oh, I'm not enjoying this. I'm really not enjoying it. I don't like him. I don't like him at all. 
I'm going to kill him. What's the tipping point? Silly. Just turn over. Or even turn it down or look over there. So many options. Take murder a bit more seriously. Here's a selection of my favourite death threats. Is he good? This one's from Yankee. What will be his persuasion? <laughs> you piece of shit! <laughs> Who the fuck do you think you are? I'm Russell. <laughs> Why don't you drop dead and die? Well, that's actually a tautology. Um, once you've dropped dead, you can't then die. <laughs> Unless Yankee is a Hindu and he believes in reincarnation. Right, drop dead. Now come back as a mouse. Now die a mouse death. <laughs> die a mouse death. Die a mouse in death. Too much cheese. I think that's what he meant. This is my favourite bit. When I emphasise it with volume, that means it's in capitals. <laughs> I'll never vote for Obama, ever! <laughs> I like that, right? Because it's as if between when he wrote never, vote for Obama, ever, as if someone tried to persuade him again to vote for Obama. <laughs> I'll never vote for Obama. He says he won't raise taxes on the middle classes, ever! <laughs> this next death threat is from Patrick, aka Bully Defender. Nice of him to include an alias. <laughs> like a superhero. Like Superman a bit. Hold on. If Bully Defender was wearing glasses, wouldn't he just be Patrick? <laughs> Screw you, Russell! Stick to UK politics and keep out of US politics! I like that he seems to think that I'm a kind of errant political TV broadcaster. <laughs> that I'm Larry King running a mop. <laughs> Just for clarity, I don't think that the British government's really good or anything. I think they're all just idiots. <laughs> Stick to figuring out your own pathetic government and your precious queen. Right, you've crossed the line there. <laughs> Bully defender. <laughs> if that is your real name, which I doubt. You can say what you like about me and condemn Parliament if you wish. But at your peril do you besmirch the name of Elizabeth Windsor. I'll slice you from nape to chops. I don't care about the Queen either. She's just a little old lady in a shiny hat. <laughs> Chief among the death threateners, in my mind at least, alone, the apotheosis of the death threatener, stands one man, and that man is White Boy. <laughs> because White Boy, alone among the death threateners, put a subject heading for his death threat email. <laughs> White boy is not a man that writes a death threat if he's not 100% sure that it's going to be read. He ain't going to take time out from his busy schedule of crystal meth addiction and racism <laughs> to write a death threat unless he knows it's going to hit home. Remember, when I emphasise it with volume, that means it's in capitals. Fuck Russell Brand and he's gonna fuck out of my country. He's a fucking arsehole, a fucking piece of shit. Go home, bitch boy. <laughs> Open. <laughs> Q 
you had me a bitch boy. <laughs> you little ugly fucking cunt. <laughs> you need to say the fuck out of my country, punk Russell fat brand. Punk Russell fat brand, how can I help you? You more than likely support Muslims that destroy the world. Bit of a leap. <laughs> I think what I meant to say when during the MTV VMA Awards I implied that the Jonas Brothers chastity rings and virginity might in fact be a cynical market employ utilising the theories of Michelle Foucault who said that in Victorian society the repression of sexuality was just another way of bringing sexuality to the forefront of our consciousnesses. It's a marketing technique. By saying that the Jonas Brothers are virgins you can't help but think about them having sex. The Jonas Brothers are not having sex. The Jonas Brothers are not having sex. The Jonas Brothers are not having sex. <laughs> As long as you're looking at the rings on their fingers, you're not wondering about where them fingers ain't straying. When I said that, I think what I meant was a jihad on all the world's Christian people. He continues. Fuck you and this fucking fat brand and get a light because you're so fucking ugly, really no shit, you're fugly. He's freestyling now. <laughs> I was so moved by white boy's letter that I replied to it. <laughs> Dear white boy, <laughs> thank you for your touching letter. Reading between the lines, I assume this to be a covert homosexual advance. <laughs> which I accept. <laughs> Yours sincerely, bitch boy. death threats, the hullabaloo, the madness. I was pretty keen to get back to blighty and everything. I thought, oh, I'll go back to England, settle down, be all quiet there, I'll be appreciated and respected and there'll be no media for all. <laughs> this was an unwise assumption. <laughs> I got back to England and right, but the English press, like some of the English press is alright, but there's elements within it, right? They, we have this thing in England, English people will testify, uh, called the Daily Mail. Now, semantically, it's a newspaper. Semantically, that's what that means. Well, let's have a look at it. It's made of paper, so where's the news, right? In practice, what it is, is distilled evil and cruelty designed to make you feel utterly afraid, full of self-loathing and unwilling ever to leave your house because of, like, I don't know, there might be an immigrant or a paedophile or something. <laughs> and even if there ain't, there might be. Just stay indoors, just in case. And everything must be viewed negatively. Don't be different. Not in the world of the Daily Mail. There is no room for that. That will be crushed. <clears throat> So here's a story. This is weird, right? Because this is in a newspaper. Paper telling us the news, right? You think the news? That means, oh, oh, there's been a car crash, there's been an earthquake, a cat gave suck to a duckling. <laughs> All them things are valid news. <laughs> this, though, check this out for some news. Russell Brand has not been sleeping well. <laughs> that should be in a newspaper. It's interesting if you're me, but for everyone else, it's like a novel. <laughs> Russell Brand has not been sleeping well. During times of stress, he is prone to grind his teeth at night, which keeps him awake. <laughs> Ow, leave me alone. How do I know this? His friends say that late nights at his rented house in Hollywood have seen the British comics slumped in front of the television. Slumped? Why use a pejorative verb in a situation where I'm just sat in front of a television? Slumped. Look at you lot, right? Are you sat or are you slumped? Slumped. Why make that negative? Because everything has to be negative. Because everything has to be dark and horrible. I'm slumped. I weren't slumped. I don't slump. I was sat all nice in front of the television like Cleopatra. Gorgeous I am. I don't 
right, Sam. My spine is not made of chalk, but everything through this prism must be conveyed negatively, even at a forensic microscopic level. Look at this bit, right? His friends say that late nights at his rented house in Hollywood. I thought, why does it say rented house in Hollywood? Why rented? And I realised because without the word rented in that sentence, it would have to read at his house in Hollywood. And people reading it would say, well, he's got a house in Hollywood. How bad can it be? <laughs> it's rented. <laughs> it's not his house. It's only temporary. It could be snatched away on a whim. It's dust on the breeze of history. Rent it. He can't redecorate. He doesn't have the authority. Rent it. The British comic slumped in front of the television, flicking channels. Something wrong with flicking channels. You're allowed to turn over the telly. Pick a channel. Don't be such a capricious flippity gibbet. These are good programs, watch them. Watch them all, even the commercials. Dead in your mind. His trademark tumbleweed hair, flat and lank. I don't do it when I'm at home watching the telly. I don't think, oh, a night in watching the telly, better make sure I've got a fucking ridiculous haircut. Just try and relax. His coal-rimmed eyes smudged and puffy. Unnecessary. Thing is, though, the thing that's extraordinary, bizarre, macabre and strange and twisted is when I read this article first, that is exactly what I was doing. <laughs> recognize me from the VMAs, then perhaps you saw my previous foray into your cultural world in the film Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Have you seen it? <laughs> Thanks. It's good being in that film. I liked it. I had to go to Hawaii for three months, right? And uh, the thing about, like, going to Hawaii for three months is it's quite difficult, actually. I mean, it's like Hawaii, you think, oh, Hawaii, that's lovely. Yeah, for a week. <laughs> Not for three months. Everyone's a bit relentlessly upbeat, aren't they? Um, it's like being beaten over the head with a fucking rainbow. <laughs> Hard it was in Hawaii, and plus I had to do really, really difficult things. Things like horse riding, that's bloody difficult, horse riding. Horse riding is not difficult, it's just like driving a car. No, it ain't. And anyway, I can't drive a car, look at me. And it's not like driving a car, because a car won't midway through a journey of its own volition just wander off into a gas station because it's hungry. Horses don't like being ridden. They can, you can sort of tell that they don't really like being a horse. They sort of seem like they're being embarrassed about it. <laughs> oh, God, sorry about this. Big, muscly cowards. <laughs> well, they know that at a dinner party, they would damage Dresden, China. They carry themselves with that kind of comportment. Awkwardness. Equine awkwardness. You might be thinking, if you saw the film Forgetting Sarah Marshall, oh, I don't remember the horse riding scene being in that film. Yeah. That's because I'm so bad at horse riding. <laughs> the footage was deemed useless. <laughs> the main bit of horse riding, because it's, like, it's hard. Like, you have to achieve mastery over that beast. And I don't like it. Like the instructor, very uppity and full of herself. Hey, come on, just get on the horse. Show it you're the boss. Show it you're the boss. Am I the boss? He goes horse riding every day. I've only been once. <laughs> bit of horse riding I was meant to do, right? I was having to gallop all the way. Well, the horse was galloping. I was sat terrified on its back while it galloped all the way over here. 
And there were some wranglers, literal wranglers, who were meant to stop it by shouting, Stop! Stop! But the horse don't understand language, so... Could have shouted anything, really. They could have done a poem by Baudelaire. At least, at least I would have enjoyed that as the horse raced past. <laughs> I don't really like it on the horse's back, because what I don't like, right, is you've got the illusion, there is not even an illusion of control with them reins. They're too flaccid and useless. I want, like, a lever in the back of his head. <laughs> like that. The reins are sort of daft, you know? Just felt like I had sparklers in my hand. I'm Russell. Right, on that bloody thing's back, no control at all. It gallops past, right? It runs straight past the wranglers. Oh, flowers in the dirt. Off it went, straight by them. And the horse kept on running till it eventually got back to its house. Where it lived. Then it just went in to its house. I'm still on it. Just went into a horse house. I was in there. Everyone else in there was a horse. It was embarrassing. I just sort of sat there and I didn't fit in at all. What's he doing in here? We do our shit to me. It's not welcome. Horrible. Another thing I had to do was surfing. That's bloody hard and made all the harder by the fact that the person teaching me it, Mike, was the world's most vigorously alpha male, right? And when I'm in the company of proper alpha men, I go a bit gay. <laughs> Mike was ludicrously alpha. The sea were incarnadine with his testosterone, right? Check out his jobs, he had. He used to be in the American Olympic water polo team. Pretty butch. Before that, he was in the American Marine Corps. Oh, do you want to be any more macho? I tell you what, Mike, why don't I just kneel down on the beach and you can beat me around the face with your erect cock? <laughs> <laughs> I can't learn! I felt all vulnerable in the sea. Just there in the sea and laying on that bloody thing. I felt all scared and beholden to him. Mike, help me, Mike, Mike, I'm drowning, I'm drowning! Come save me, you big fucking mermaid! seen the film Sarah Marshall will go, oh, I wonder why Russell had to have surfing lessons as he wasn't surfing in the film. <laughs> That's because I'm so rubbish at surfing, it was struck from the record and destroyed. <laughs> the original script read, Order Snow, played by Russell Brand, surfs across the ocean. What was actually filmed was, Order Snow, played by Russell Brand, sits motionless on a surfboard. <laughs> surfing both ideologically and semantically. Who, other than the utterly arrogant, would look at the ocean, the endless, timeless, infinite ocean, who would look at it in all its power and all its incredible potency and think, I want to stand on that. <laughs> Even Jesus only did it once to make a point. He weren't a surfer. Jesus didn't go back to the Sea of Galilee every weekend. Hey, man. <laughs> Hang ten commandments. Wipe out leprosy. <laughs> semantically misleading. I don't like things like that. Snowboarding's like that. Semantically misleading. Someone might come up to you and go, Here, do you want to go snowboarding? Snowboarding. I once thought to myself, yeah, snowboarding. That's the image. Snowboarding. <laughs> snowboarding. <laughs> Not snowboarding. <laughs> Not snowboarding. <laughs> so evil metal thing that they use to take you back to the top of the mountain after you've fallen down it. <laughs> I was terrified while I was queuing up for that. All my friends, blissful and unaware and confident, placing the iron bar between their thighs like an aluminium phallus, hair blowing in the breeze, laughing in the face of gravity, laughing in the face of God. Ha 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 ha! We must tell Gatsby of this day. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, I stand here like a condemned man, moving ever closer, trudging my own green mile, and knowing that here comes the horror, then sure enough, he grabs my genitals, upends me, drags me through the snow. Ah! While little French ski robot children, all perfect zigzag cyborgs. Fuck you! Plus, I'm not famous in Hawaii, right? So, it makes it harder to chat up women. When you're famous, chatting up women gets a lot easier. I've managed to abbreviate the process of seduction to a gesture now. Hmm? <laughs> and Mila Kunis was on that island in the film, and I fancied her. She is sort of my type, which is, well, it's not really that specific. I kind of like women aged between 18 and death. <laughs> and I won't be pushed on that. Doesn't matter how much you tart up a corpse. You could be the world's finest embalmist. I would not be swayed. <laughs> yeah. So I tried to chat her up a bit, Mila Kunis, thought oh, I might find salvation through love, a bit of redemption. You know, in the secular age, there is no God. Try and save yourself through love. All right, hello, Mila Kunis, how are you? Not very good, that is it. It's not interesting for Mila Kunis to listen to it. Oh, yeah, hi, my boyfriend's coming. My boyfriend, Mac, he's coming to the island, my boyfriend, Mac. Right? And it's like, how long is it polite to pretend to continue to listen to someone after they've revealed they've got a boyfriend. <laughs> I think 11 seconds. Right, I've got to go. Some people will be surprised that I was chatting up Mila Kunis at all because some people seem to think I'm gay, I notice. Just like to point out that I'm not gay. I just dress incredibly well. <laughs> I have a wonderful haircut and I'm quite vulnerable and sensitive so women trust me and feel safe around me, then bang, pregnant, bang, pregnant, bang, pregnant. Another generation. My boyfriend, Mac, my boyfriend, Mac, Mac, my boyfriend, Mac. On the first day of filming, I was holed up in my trailer, which amounted to a single dwelling shanty town. She come out of hers, all elegant, Hey, Russell, Russell, meet Mac, meet my boyfriend, Mac. Oh, all right, Mac, say I, and walked past what was quite clearly Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> hey, Mac, Mac, let's not rebrand him as Mac. That is Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> you are fucking Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> right. Do the face, Macaulay Culkin. Do it. Ah! Do it. Ah! Do it. Ah! Right, Macaulay Culkin. You come here. You get in that trailer and lock yourself in. I'm going to go and get Joe Pesci. We're going to try and break in. You're going to defend yourself with pots and pans. And the whole rest of the time that I was there, I had to go, hey, all right, Mac. Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin, Macaulay Culkin. Plus, there's stuff you want to ask him, but you can't. You want to go, hey, Macaulay Culkin. Come on, mate. Be honest, what happened? Mm, Michael Jackson. Mm. <laughs> Never land. Sometimes land. <laughs> If success in Hollywood can't bring about any kind of illumination, perhaps then 
Approval of one anointed by God would be of some value. Between God and us stands only Elizabeth Windsor, the Queen of England. And I've met her, right? And so I must be valuable in some way. Oh, oh, what? I could have met her under dubious circumstances. She wasn't opening a lunatic asylum I was a patient in. I met her legit at the Royal Variety performance. Difficult, though, to meet the Queen, even if you're doing it to somehow nourish you. Because, like, before you meet her, you don't have to get a lot of protocols and rules before you meet Her Majesty, the Queen of England. Literally a flunky-type character will approach you. Oh, hello there. And give you some rules. Oh, I see. You're the comedian, although you seem to be little more than a bearded lady. Well, <laughs> let me give you some rules, young man. When you meet Her Majesty, the Queen, you will call her Mamas in Jam, not Mamas in Arm. You will bow from the head, not from the waist, and don't curtsy, she won't think it's cute. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for the information. But to give me that um, information is to assume that my mind is my ally. <laughs> it ain't. Because my mind wants to fuck me up a little bit, right? Say I'm on a precipice of a tall building looking down thinking, bloody hell, that's really high. You'd probably die if you jump off that. My mind goes, go on, jump off of it. Go on, jump. <laughs> right? And say I'm at a wedding ceremony and it gets to that bit where it goes, if anybody here knows any reason why these two people should be joined together in holy matrimony, speak now or forever, all just silence. Part of me always wants to go, yeah, he's a puff and I've said there this morning, right? <laughs> Never do. Never do. And what about this? What if I'm with a really sweet little old lady and I'm drinking a really hot cup of tea? And she's a nice little old lady. She's benevolent, not malevolent, not a horrible little old lady. You're right, darling. How's your mum? You're still going swimming. You're still doing well. She's really nice, but all the time she's talking, I'm thinking, I could throw this tea right in her fucking face. <laughs> I would never do it. But it's just the possibility that you could graffiti reality in that moment. It torments me. So while I'm waiting to meet the Queen and she's edging along, shaking the hands of the other performers, I'm trying to remember all them rules, all them protocols. Mamas in jam, not mamas in arm. Mamas in jam, not mamas in arm. Bow from the head, not from the waist. Don't curtsy. Mamas in jam, mamas in arm. Mamas in jam, mamas in arm. Bow from the head, don't curtsy. Part of my mind is thinking, grab a fucking tip. <laughs> Pull it all on that skipping rope. <laughs> Pull in your mouth, fuck it like Turk, slip up. Which means I shall probably never be knighted. Which may be a good thing, in and of itself, because if I found myself, pun bended knee, in front of Her Majesty the Queen, with my mind, the temptation, you know, it wouldn't be just me being elevated to the status of a god, it would be her. <laughs> I've got some sex tips if you want them. They are oral sex tips. They're oral sex tips is what they are, more specifically. Oral sex tips, that can be done on a woman by anyone. I ain't bothered about things like that. Do you like? It's all right. Bit of a laugh. Here are the tips. <clears throat> this is a good one. Oh, there's not really any comedic value to this. Uh, it's just some sex tips, really. I just like the idea you go home with some real take-home knowledge that you can try out on your chums. <laughs> so here it is. What you want to do for uh, labial stimulation is expel air dramatically through your own mouth <laughs> and vibrate their labia. <laughs> That's the horse technique. It works. Don't be shy about it. <laughs> then work your way up a little bit higher and use a vibration on your own lips at the front of your mouth. <laughs> on the clitoris. On the clitoris. <laughs> You're a bit shy about doing it, but don't be. <laughs> the kazoo. They like it. <laughs> also, mix it up a bit. <laughs> Have fun down there. Get tropical. I know what you're worried about. You're worried about committing in that situation and it not working out, right? Do you think you might look silly? That you might be going... <laughs> what on earth are you doing down there? Style it out. <laughs> Just keep going. Commit. <laughs> Merry Christmas. People like it.
exist within your sexuality, for Freud said the sexual self is the essential self. Who you are when you're fucking, that's who you are in your soul. Good, because I like me better when I'm having it off, right? Because the rest of the time I'm a sort of PVC, Willy Wonka, scarecrow, Rob the bonded shop nitwit, but I find realization through coitus, through the conjugal I am angelic somehow, like, right? The embodiment of the action, e.g. Prince, right? When Prince is performing rock and roll, right? Prince is rock and roll. He is the music. He becomes it. Prince don't come out on the stage and go, Oh, well, I've come to do some rock and roll. He embodies it. He becomes it. He is the moment. He is the moment of his performance. And me, when I'm lost in my sexuality, when I'm down in the miasma, when I'm primal yet celestial, lost, lost, lost in that moment, the absolute wonderment, part reptile, part man, I think, oh, 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 I'm not fucking. I am fuck. <laughs> The only problem is the navigation of two vastly different psychological states. The pre-ejaculatory male psychology and the post-ejaculatory male psychology. I'm a different person after I've come. Before I come, I kind of saucy, filthy, dirty, animal man thing, you know? I'm up for it. I'll do out. Yeah. Let's get lost together. Let's become one. We are the flesh. Try the sewing machine, the anaconda, and introducing the matrix. They're all there. Yeah. I'm going to make you hear color. I'm going to make you see sound. We're going to die tonight. Ah, oh, fuck me, fuck me. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Then after I come, it's like, oh my God, what have I done? A sense of profound existential angst. A sense of loss. The idea that somehow I've let my mum down. <laughs> Don't think she'd care. And that is why I am baffled by the British phenomena of seagulling. Seagulling is a craze, if we can call it such, in British schools where post, evidently, adolescent boys, post pubescent boys, masturbate and then ejaculate into their own cupped hand, go up to a school friend or a teacher and say, Seagulling! <laughs> now I'll be the first to admit that that is bad manners. <laughs> but that is not what intrigues me. I am intrigued by their ability to navigate these undulating psychological states. How can a schoolboy get from the pre-ejaculatory psychology to the post? Such a tumultuous, undulating, unsure terrain. I can't cope with it. I'm a man and just a boy. How do they do that? How can they cope with that profound journey? How can a boy, a boy, be masturbating and think, Oh, oh, I'm going to come. One day I will die. See, Gulling! <laughs> Right, I'm off now. Have you had a nice time? <laughs> I always think at this point, you know, we've had a lovely evening, what a wonderful gig we've had, you know, and I always think... I crave the best possible outcome, the best possible anecdote, right? And say, so, you know, someone later on may say to you, oh, you went and saw Russell Brand. How was that gig? You may say, yeah, it's all right. Bit wordy. <laughs> or you may respond, Russell Brand, pff, more than a comic, he's a prophet, a poet, a genius, the leader of the revolution. I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> Not when God gave me this. interesting anecdote I believe would be this one what if someone went oh you saw Russell Brand what was it like he went yeah it's good it's funny and everything every, everything one would anticipate from such a situation but then towards the end of the evening at Russell's behest suddenly the room 
was darkened, blackness, all the lights went out, all of them, it was just complete darkness everywhere, everywhere throughout. And then we all just took our clothes off and fucked each other. It was chaos in there. We surfed out of that fear on the Fifth Avenue on a river of sperm. We could do that. We could literally do that. There's no law against it. There's one law, indecent exposure. But on this scale, how can it be policed? I suppose a more realistic obstacle is the fact that some of you may be here with members of your family. And nothing ruins an orgy like bumping into your own mum, I think. Hey, don't read into that now. I will say this, actually. <clears throat> Some of you, uh, if you're adult, human, single, females, you might find me really sexually attractive and want to have sex with me. Oh, I'd love to have sex with Russell, but, you know, he's so famous in England, I hear, I'm not good enough. <laughs> you probably are. <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> I do prefer threesomes, not because I'm a cynical man who can't cope with intimacy, but because, as I've explained, I'm looking for the one, salvation, my own personal Jesus. And I think if I audition women two at a time, I'll find her quicker. <laughs> I should stress that, uh, like, I do like threesomes. This is legit. I mean it. But, like, uh, I like better a threesome where it's me and two girls. Not where, like, it's a bloke and his girlfriend. That's less than I would have got anyway. All I've done there is doubled the risk of someone farting during sex. <laughs> and put myself under perpetual threat of what I know as nut brush. <laughs> particularly, particularly, if you take that threesome, two guys, one girl, to its natural, and it is natural conclusion, yeah? <laughs> hey, these are just words to you. I live this shit. Um, I did have a threesome with a mate once, with my mate, uh, my mate Matt, actually. We had a threesome with a girl, right? And like, uh, right, it was nice. We had a really lovely evening, everyone involved, right? But I accidentally, keyword, got a little bit, key phrase, I accidentally got a little bit of sperm on Matt's leg. <laughs> and Matt, in the most childish act of tit-for-tat retaliation, <laughs> In human history, went, well, fucking hell, Russell. <laughs> ah, 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 ah. Chasing me like his cock was a spunky war cannon. <laughs> ah, ah. Meanwhile, as a girl just sat there, oh, boys. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> Afterwards, when I come and talk to you all, uh, if you are a woman, and you, you, be sure when you approach me, you might think, oh, I want to have sex. Be sure it is sex you want and not an autograph. There seems to be some confusion. <laughs> oh, I want to have sex, I want to have sex. But when they get there, what they want is an autograph. You know? By then I'm worked up. You know? So yeah, I'll give you an autograph across the wall of your uterus in sperm. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Hare Krishna, I love you. Good night. I'm